Hi chess fans, in this video we will look at the game between Igor Natav with white and Alexander Onishuk with black. Alex Onishuk of course a very strong grandmaster and in this game um, Igor Natav was having a few less rating points but nonetheless white won. So let's have a look at the game. After e4, e5, knight f3, knight c6, d4 we reached the Scottish defense. E takes, knight takes, bishop c5. Bishop e3 is one of the main lines. The other main line is to play knight f6 here. And after bishop c5, bishop e3, queen f6 um, is an important line. And normally um, white can continue with the setup um, of playing c3 and moving the bishop here, the knight here, and playing f3. For example, knight g7, bishop c4, knight e5, bishop e2. Queen g6, castle d6, f3, castle knight d2, and this is the setup that white can choose here. But instead, after queen f6, white also has the sharp knight to b5. And the idea is that white is allowing bishop e3, as happened in the game, and after f takes, queen h5, h5 check, g3, black can play, Queen takes, and the idea, um, black is attacking the rook, but the idea is that white, after knight b5, is threatening this um, fork on the king. So in this particular variation, white is now pawn up, but uh, black is now pawn up, and white wins the pawn back immediately. King d8, knight takes, queen takes, and after queen d6, for example, knight f6, knight d2, Black wants to maybe exchange the active queen. Um, white has generated the positional resource of having the black king in the center. And the black queen in this particular variation is also a little bit of a liability, while white's pieces are very active. In return, black has potentially the slightly weak pawn on e3, but at the moment, um, even though the engine shows the position is equal, I think this is much easier to play with white. So that's why in this position after g3, the queen is going back to d8 to protect the c7 square. So let's have a look at this position. Um, white has, uh, has opened up uh, its pieces, and we can see that these pieces can um, pause, uh, cause some problems to black. Um, but white in return for this has a little bit of um, potentially weak pawns here in the center. So the stage is set for a very active play by white, and black is a little bit, well, it's actually quite a lot back in uh, development right now, and this is the disbalance in the position. White can continue here, as it happened in the game with queen g4, attacking the g7 pawn, and now black chose to defend this pawn. And now Again, the positional weakness is the king in the center here, and uh, this is um, balanced against the two pawns that are potentially weak in an endgame here. Okay, white played queen f4, just um, hinting at the idea of playing bishop c4 um, with tempo and also threatening this pawn here two times. Black uh, denies this with uh, d6. White continues developing knight c3. And after knight e7, white now plays um, putting pressure on this pawn. So in this position here, probably it was better to play knight e5 to protect this pawn. Um, but still, this looks uh, this looks very this looks very dangerous. So even if white plays bishop b3 here, the kind of threat. Uh, still maintains and this looks a bit scary because white can gang up on this pawn even more. That's why Onishok played f6 here, but this hands white um, a very strong positional resource, which is this diagonal here. Um, this light squared bishop is controlling the diagonal, the rook is uh, kind of stuck here because black cannot castle anymore, and it's not so easy for black to exchange the light squared bishops. White continues um, castling long, and now white has two tactical liabilities. Um, 
White has a loose piece here. The bishop on c4 can be attacked, and the queen here is also prone to attack by black's pieces. And this allows black some peace play. After knight e6, the queen is attacked, the queen goes back. After knight e5, the bishop is attacked and drops back. Bishop g4 attacks the rook, the rook moves up. And black has activated his pieces a little bit. Okay. But the bishop um, realized it's not doing much here, so it's going back, also to keep a little bit control maybe over these light squares. And white simply plays h3 with the idea of pushing the pawns in a minority attack against the king. Uh, black uh, tries to play against this with h5. And now very interesting, knight d4. Knight d4 eyeing the e6 square and the f4 square and it's clear that white tries to take advantage of the positional resource of the light square control. Black tries to um, push c6 and maybe at some point um, d5 to shut down these light squares, maybe also provide some space for his queen, but it also creates a tactical weakness here on d6. And white is immediately trying to exploit this, the knight is attacking this weakness, and um, the pawn cannot move forward because it would be um, it could be taken like this. The knight is protected by the queen, and there are too many pieces controlling the square. The queen is also pinned, so that's not a good idea. Black bails out and exchanges the bishop for the knight. But this does two things for white. First, um, the pawn weakness is um, is not there anymore. It's removed. There's no double pawn here anymore. And now white enjoys, after the light square bishop of black has been exchanged, white enjoys strong light square control. Black continued knight e7, because the knight was attacked, e4 solidifies the pawns in the center. Black tries to get some counterplay with a5, and after bishop e6, white is just clamping down on these light squares. Queen c7, g4, g5. Now in this position, um, how should white play? So the black king is exposed here and the queen and the rooks are ready to maybe gang up on the queen, um, uh, on the king. The bishop is already here controlling important squares and maybe this knight can jump in as well. So what white wants to do here is to open up the position and what he could play immediately is f takes g. And if the knight takes, the queen is threatening to jump in here and after just a few moves it, it, it gets very dangerous. So here uh, white is already having double threats. And if king g7 trying to protect the pawn, this pawn is now an extra pawn. Uh, white can play g takes h5 protect the pawn, after rook takes knight e2 the knight is jumping into strong, strong squares. Even after knight takes the knight will find squares and open up the position against the king. So um, Igor Natav didn't go for g takes f6, but instead played h4, another way of opening up the position. No matter how these pawns are exchanged, it's maybe an even more straightforward way to open up the position. After g takes h, rook takes, queen to b6, white is, is close to achieving its goal to open up the position. But in this position, um, Igor Natov placed a very interesting move, knight to d1. And it's a psychological resource um, here because the black queen would have had maybe the e3 square to generate some counterplay or the b2 square to generate some counterplay. And now the knight is denying this to the queen. And at the same time, it's also an active move because the knight didn't have many squares to jump to. Uh, maybe this would have been a route as well. But um, it's also an active move because after knight d1, the knight can be brought into the game like this once these pawns are exchanged. Okay, black. I don't know what black's plan is here. Um, yeah, black just tries to maybe activate this rook. Um, but it's already very hard to play because white can now take this pawn. And after king h7, that was probably the idea to, to tuck the king in here. Uh, white simply brings in the rooks, and you can see here the engine already says white is totally winning. So let's have a look at the rest of the game. Rook to g8, and now interesting, rook g6. 
So black could take this and win an exchange, but this would allow white to take back with the pawn and get in the resource of two past pawns, and this is more valuable than an exchange. So white is very happy to simply put the rook here, and of course if the rook exchanges, that's um, also very, very bad for white. Okay, um, queen d8, trying to bring in the queen for the defense, queen f4, threatening mate already, queen is trying to um, prevent this, controlling um, the square on h6, and rook h2, very interesting move, it's a positional or strategic move, the idea is to double rooks, this pawn is not attacked anymore, so this rook can be put to better use, and the rook is eyeing to go to g2, where it cannot be attacked so easily by this knight. Rook h8, knight e3, rook e8, the rooks are doubled. Now black, the pressure is so big, uh, white is threatening to triple here on this file and play rook g7 and simply win. So now black has to take the rook, but this hands over the um, double pass pawns to white and now the position is totally lost. It's check, king g7 only move, rook h2 protecting the pawn, f5, and now in this position here, what is the tactical blow that wins the game? h6, allowing the king to take on g6, but then playing um, rook g6, and the idea is, or the tactical motive is a mating net. If the king moves to h7, we simply win the queen, and if the king moves to f6, we have e takes with the threat, with the double threat of mate either here or here. So, for example, after rook to g7, queen d4 is mate. After f5, white played the very human move uh, e takes f. Um, white has all the time in the world. There are too many um, plans and weaknesses. And the game continued with a knight sacrifice here on g6. But white played f6. And Black resigned. The point is that after um, queen takes, white has the resource h h6 check, and the king has to um, give up control of the queen, and white will win the queen in the next move. Okay, thanks a lot for watching, and I hope to see you next time. Bye for now.